and welcome parents, caregivers, administrators, and friends. And for those of you who have just joined, my name is Michael Herring, and I'm president of Personal Safety and Education Development, and welcome. And today's workshop is Anxiety and Key Coping Strategies for Our Current Times. And the agenda that we're going to follow today, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to do an assessment. Um, and it's really important to understand why we're doing that. And I'll explain as we get, get closer. Um, then we're going to talk about regaining and ma maintaining control. That is going to be the basis of this workshop. So just think about the theme and I'll explain to you why that's critical as well. Then a couple of CP CBT um, techniques, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, something called redirect, replace. There's several others we do in other workshops, but in the interest of time, I'm going to just cover these two today. And then lastly, um, you'll see different strategies and techniques that are wrapped around everything that we're going to discuss today. And then we'll leave some time at the end, hopefully, for some questions. And feel free. I'm I'm the type that I don't like things parked in a parking lot until later. I'd rather ask it in the context of what we're discuss what we're discuss what we're discussing and when we're discussing it. So it's current and it's for the benefit of everyone. As I always say during my workshops, this workshop is going to accomplish one of three things. Number one, it's going to affirm what some of you are already doing for yourselves and for your children. Number For others, it's going to be tweaks to what you're already doing, which is still good. It, sounds, it says that you have a really wonderful foundation. We're going to just level it up a little bit. And then for the remaining, what it's going to do, and hopefully it's going to create new ways of thinking, new neural pathways. And it takes time to create that, but over time it can happen. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. All right, so let's get started. What you'll need is a pen, pencil, or and a piece of paper, particularly for the first part that we're going to engage in, which is the assessment. So I'll give you a couple seconds to put your hands on those things. You probably have them pretty close to you. Okay. So this is the assessment. The assessment is something called the GAD7. And GAD stands for General Anxiety Disorder, which is what we're going to cover today. We're not going to look at trauma-induced or trauma, um, yeah, trauma-induced anxiety. That's a whole nother chapter. So we're going to just look at general anxiety disorder. G, the GAD seven is the is the one that most therapists use to establish a baseline, and then from there, then they can establish programs for their clients. So this is just seven questions. And all I want you to do, you don't have to write the questions. All I want you to do is write the following down as the key to the answers. Not at all equals zero. Several days equals one. More than half the days equals two. And nearly every day equals three. That's the only thing I need you to write down so you'll know how to respond to the questions when I ask, ask them. And I, when I ask these questions, I want you to think in the context of the last month. How have you been feeling over the last month? I mean, you, we could we could do two weeks, we could do a week, we could do a year, but let's let's say a month. Let's just narrow it down to a month. So not at all equals zero. Several days equals one. More than half the days equals two, and nearly every day equals three. All right, so let's begin. And I'm going to read these a little fast because I don't want you to really contemplate too long. I want, to, I want you really just to get your gut reaction. So the first question is, feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge over the last month? Not at all, zero, seven days, one, more than half the days, two, nearly every day, three. Not being able to stop or control worrying. Worrying too much about different things. Number four, trouble relaxing. Number five, being so restless that it's hard to sit still. Number six, becoming easily annoyed or irritable. And number seven, the last one, feeling afraid as if something awful might happen. There are people who just walk around with that sense of doom that any day something's going to happen. So what I want you to do is add up your numbers to get a total score. And then we're going to see what your scores mean. And the reason why this is important as far as parents too is because many times the anxiety that children are dealing with and they feel 
is a direct correlation to the parent's level of anxiety. So you first have to establish what your levels are, right? So if anyone needs any more time adding, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to see where you came out. Okay, so anyone who scored zero to four would mean that you have mild anxiety, which is good. And I'll explain that in a minute. Five to nine, moderate anxiety, 10 to 14, moderately severe, and 15 to 21 is severe anxiety. So let me just state this up front. I am not a therapist. I'm not a clinician. If anyone scored 15 to 21 um, and they haven't sought out counseling, please make sure you get some th type of therapeutic intervention. It is really critical that you do that for yourself and your loved ones. In the same assessment, if your children are old enough, please make sure that you administer it to them as well. I will make, I'll make either the PowerPoint available, or I'll make some of the slides available, or at the end, if you personally would like a copy of it, you can put your email in, and I'll make sure that you receive the information, too, that you can share with your loved ones. So let me go back to zero to four. Zero to four meaning mild anxiety. Basically, we all need to have a le certain level of anxiety to be safe, secure, um, to, to be aware of situational dangers. Um, think about it. When we used to live in the woods with animals and we all lived together at some point in time, we had to be situationally aware. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't survive. So there is a level of anxiety that is, that is needed. It keeps us sharp. It keeps us uh, on point. Before doing this workshop, I felt a, a little butterfly. And that's good because I like feeling that because that keeps me charged. It keeps me sharp and on point. So we all need that. However, when you start getting up into the sevens and above, that's when you really want to keep an eye on things. So the only question I'm going to ask is, because this is personal, unless people want to share, they certainly can. But all I want to ask is, did anyone here score zero to four? That's the one I'm interested in, zero to four. And if so, just put it in the chat if anyone here scored zero to four. So no one. Oh, okay. Once in a while when I do the workshop, I'll have someone or a couple people who've scored zero to four. And I have them share. Whoops, I have some person. Want someone here? Let's see. Oh, four. Okay, good, good. Um, I usually have them share what are they doing to maintain that level. Uh, because it's it's not it's not rare, but it's 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 a few people who are able to maintain that level. So I just ask them, and I'm going to share with you some of the things they've told me over the years that may help you, because there's a common thread that tends to run through people that have zero to four. So let me ask you. Um, let me see what their name was. I'm so sorry, Levon. If you don't mind me asking, if you don't mind sharing, what do you do in your day to day? Um, business day-to-day -day operations that 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 you say you that you have a four what do you do to maintain that um simply for me i just um take the mantra i only can control what i can control mm. and i allow myself to not get caught up in things i don't control and then i do an affirmation in the morning to wow. make sure that i center myself so that i put myself in a position not to take on more things without having the responsibility know that I can't complete them. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. And you know what you just did? You just basically laid the entire foundation of this workshop. So that is awesome. That's exactly what I hear often and some of the things we're going to go over today. And then for those of you who scored in, in the yellow and the orange, what you're going to see um, throughout the presentation, you're going to see the same chart. And in this chart or next to it, you're going to see your numbers. And if you scored within that range, these are the strategies, techniques that would really help you. Okay. So but you'll see this throughout the presentation. So, but thank you for sharing, Levon. I appreciate that. So what I want to ask is this. Oh, I already asked a zero to four. Those who scored in zero to four range over time, this is what parents have showed, have shared with me. It has a lot to do with gratitude, their attitude. I had a parent tell me, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, they try to really put it in perspective. You know, is is the world going to be spinning on its axis tomorrow? Am I going to be around tomorrow? So they just ask themselves these questions. And then, like LaVon just shared, uh, one shared an affirmation. It was a very, very simple one. I got this. <laughs> you know, I got this. And some people use groundedness. I 
hike every day. I'm in the woods every single day after this workshop between now and the next one. I have one in between this one. I'll be out in the woods hiking because that's how I ground myself and, and stay focused. And I need to do that to decompress. So there are different ways of handling this. And like I said, you'll see some strategies along the way. Right. So that may that may help you, you know, for those of you who had didn't score zero to four. This may help. Now, let's look at anxiety and basically let's strip it down and see where, where, where it's really what it comes down to. Anxiety often comes from feeling or thinking that you have no control over your situation or outcome, which creates fear, which triggers anxiety. So they build upon each other. So that's why the basis of this workshop is how do we maintain and regain control? You, you, you maintain, regain control your fear level goes down, your fear level goes down, anxiety goes down. Now, remember, we're only talking about general anxiety disorder. We're not talking about um, trauma-induced anxiety, all right? That's, like I said, it's a different, different chapter, different workshop altogether, all right? So remember, control is at the base. So let's try to figure out how do we maintain control. So let me just ask some of you, or anyone could respond, what areas of your life do you feel less in control of and stressed? Because only one person... Rece uh, uh, had that zero to four, they, they score within the zero to four. So I would imagine that means the rest of you were either five to nine or 10 to 14. And hopefully, you know, no one was 15 to 21. So tell me, what areas of your life do you feel less in control of? Anyone could speak, let's be transparent. Oh. I think in a family, for me, it's a family. Yeah. Family, yeah, family. family. Okay. <laughs> now, family, meaning you worry about them constantly or without without being, you know, I don't want to be too, I'm going to impose too much. Um, is it that you worry about them or they're just particular situations that you're dealing with? Just <laughs> because of the parents' love. Yeah, I would say, no. Because of what? I'm sorry. Parents' concern. Parents' concern, children. right, for the yeah. children. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, yes yeah. I, I've, I've met parents over the years who have grown children, I mean, who are in their 30s and 40s, and they're constantly ruminating and constantly worried about them. And I'm like, wow, you know, they haven't been able to take the, the, the their foot off the pedal. And they're grown children with their own children, and which is... You know, so I say, yeah, we have to certainly do something about that. Health, jobs, kids, well-being, schools, I'm doing the best for them. Okay, well, good. I'm glad that you feel that, that you're doing the best for them. That's, that's a good start right there that you, that you know that you are. So let's talk about what other areas, because I'm going to share something with you. But, but the first thing I have to ask you, if you, for those of you that scored 10 to 14 within that range, this would really help out some of these questions and creating boundaries. The question is, do you have boundaries and non-negotiables? I mean, things that you just don't compromise in and with, and I'll share some of those with you in a minute. And the question is, do you need to tighten some of those boundaries? And the last one is, when do you say no? When do you say no? And people, a lot of people just, it's the most powerful word that we have in our arsenal that we can say, Seldom do people, people don't like to use no because they feel that either they're going to reject someone, they're going to hurt someone's feelings, they're not going to get that opportunity again, someone's going to pass them by, get the promotion. We have to really empower ourselves with this word no. And, and I know a lot of people who just don't have boundaries. And because of that, they're dealing with a lot of stress and they're dealing with a lot of anxiety. So these are questions I really want you to ask yourself. You don't have, you know, you don't have to put them out in public, but just ask yourself, do you have boundaries? Do you have non-negotiables, even with your children? And I'll share what, what some of these are that some parents have shared with me over the years. Yeah, they, they decided, listen, I'm not, I refuse to stay at work past 630. I'm no longer doing that. I do not respond to emails or calls on the weekends. Now, personally, I used to work seven days a week. I stopped that about a year ago because I had to do it for my own stress levels and anxiety that was creeping in. And you get an email and you say, what is this? And I have to respond to it. So what I decided to do, I take you either Saturday or Sunday and I don't answer calls. I don't answer emails and I get them 
all throughout the weekends. And I'm like, wow, don't people ever like stop working? And so that's what I decide to do. So it depends on my schedule. I may, it may be Saturday, it may be Sunday, but one of those days I don't respond to emails. I don't even turn my computer on, nothing. That's my non-negotiable. That's my boundary. Someone put something in the chat. Let me just see. It's hard for empathizers to say no because you feel guilty and not helping that when you when you could. Yes, and the guilt. There's a lot of guilt with saying no. That's why again, the people don't use. They don't say no. But at the consequence of what? At the consequence of your health, your welfare, your levels of anxiety. We self preservation is. We have to. We have to take care of ourselves. Um, going forward, I will no longer allow my supervisor to talk to me in a disrespectful manner. Had a parent share that. That's it. She's had enough. And the last one, I'll no longer cover my colleagues by doing their work. And that happens whether it's in college, in schools, or just in the workforce. These are certain, these are a couple of no uh, boundaries that some parents have. Um, I can relate to that. It's hard saying no. Yeah, that's why a lot of us are under the pressures that we're under. And we can limit, uh, uh, reduce some of it by using that word, no. And not feeling guilty, not feeling you're going to be passed over. Empower yourself. We, we have to. Okay. Now, let me just shift very quickly. I want to talk about um, our children and our loved ones. Depend on some culture, they may feel guilty to say no. You're absolutely right. Some cultures, it's not expected. That word is not expected to say, you're not expected to say no. But then again, if you're in that red area that we talked about, that 15 to 21, then something has to give. You know, something has to give. Either you're going to give or something else has to give, right? So let's shift a little bit and talk about our loved ones and our children. What are some of the ways we can give our children a sense of control? And this is just a question I want to throw out there. Just think about ordinary day, day-to-day -day things that they do. We engage them. And what are ways that we can give them a sense of control? Because a lot of kids don't feel like they have a sense of control any longer. What can we do? Simple things. Just think simple. And I know some of you are already doing some of these things that I'm, that I'm going to share with you. So just give me some ideas. What, what are the ways that we can give our children a sense of control? Someone put something in the chat. Let them choose their outfit. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Be a constant in their life. I like that before. Be a constant in their life. Um, give them a sense of control. Yes, yes. In fact, it's so interesting. Before the pandemic, um, a lot of a lot of kids, students um, had a little bit more say-so control. A couple of principals shared this with me, that they, that they had students come to their office who were in tears because they felt they were no longer, they no longer had a sense of control and voice. Because what happens oftentimes when we feel as parents and adults and caregivers that, um, that we don't have control because let's say the pandemic, we didn't know what was happening day to day. What we try to do is control the things we can try to control. And many of us didn't have a lot of control over anything, but what did we try to control? We try to control our children. And by doing that, we suppressed them and we gave them, uh, we took away their choice and their voice. And I had principals telling me this all the time. Yes, um, Dr. Jordan, you raise your hand. Yeah, yes. hi. hi. Um, I, like, communication is key. And mm -hmm. during communication, like, I always find, like, I do better when I try to see it through their lens. Mm -hmm. you know, so that way, like, I can relate. It's like, okay, I hear what you're saying. And at your age and at this point in your life, I try to get to a point where as okay, now I know why you think that way and then try and come back. Yep. Yep. Well, to me, that's um, empathy. <laughs> you know, that's empathy is not saying, oh, I know how you feel, but actually reversing roles, trying to see it from their perspective, from their lens. You're absolutely right about that. And thank you for sharing that. And someone else put something in the chat to think twice before you speak and do. Yeah. Always, always. Um, I believe in Measuring twice and cutting once. And I use that in some of the workshops that we talk about, but it's true. You know, you want to make sure you listen very carefully. All right, so let me share with you some of the areas that parents have shared with me. What's for dinner? Have them decide. What's for dinner? And maybe even what time to eat. What music to play in the car? They're going to probably do that anyway. They're going to probably monopolize and take over the car anyway and play music that you may not even want to hear, but allow them to do that. 
plan weekend family vacations. I knew my, my son was eight years old. We had him plan our weekend, you know, just getaways in the city. We're going to the library, uh, going to the museums rather. And he would plan what time we're leaving, how we, what mode of transportation would take him, where we're going to have lunch, how much does it cost? I mean, all of that. And they love that type of, that sense of control. Now he's 19, soon to be 20, he's in college. And guess what? He plans all our vacations every year. And he plans it from soups to nuts, soup to nuts. We give him a budget. He loves this. Give them some type of control like that. Choice and voice, I call it. Um, what time to put their cell phone away at night. That's a big one. And what style to wear. Someone mentioned that before about what to wear, what outfits and attire to wear. Um, how late to stay up within reason. And I'll show you, show you how this works later on because we just can't just give them give the, the store away. We can't give the entire store away, but within reason. And what time to come home from a friend's house. These are all things that we can, we can do to give them a sense of choice and voice. And the more they have of that, the more control they feel they in they have of their life, the less anxiety they feel when it comes to general anxiety. Okay. So let me just give you the, uh, an example, perfect example. One of the most stressful times comes at night when Ashley must turn off her cell phone and devices and go to bed. She gets so dysregulated when I tell her it's time. Last week, we, we decided to allow Ashley to choose one of three times to turn off her device before going to bed. What a difference it's made. We no longer argue and bedtime is stress-free. So let me ask you, what did Ashley's parents give her? What did they give her? A very easy question. What did they give her? I think someone put it in the chat. Let me see. Control. Exactly, Erica. Control. Power. Control. A choice. Exactly. And how this works is this, and you could do this with anything. Some of the samples I've showed you before when it comes to what time to come home, how late to stay up. And this works brilliantly. All you do you set the parameters because you're the guardian, you're the parent, but within those parameters, you give them a couple of choices. Um, do you want to put your phone away at eight o'clock, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock? Now we know what, at which time Ashley's going to pick. I mean, that's a no brainer. It's going to be 10 o'clock. What time do you want to come back from your, your friend's home house? Um, six o'clock, seven o'clock or eight o'clock. We know what they're going to choose. We're going to choose eight o'clock, but at least they feel they're in control. Give them those choices and give them a voice in it. It's very easy. And it works brilliantly. And it also cuts down on a whole lot of um, challenging behaviors, which I cover in a different workshop altogether. Um, power. Okay. Good. Good. Most of you hit it right on the head. The power or control, but they gave it control by giving her choice and voice. And let me just share this video with you. It's called The Circle of Control. I think it's um, very useful and it's very practical. And for those that like to, draw and like to see things visually laid out. It's not going to be for everyone because we all have different modalities of learning. But for those of you who are visually uh, uh, attuned this way, this may make sense to many of you. Hi, friends. Today you will learn about the circle of control. The circle of control is a tool that can help you manage stressful situations, anxiety, or moments of overwhelm. The goal of this activity is to help you identify the things in your life that you can and cannot control. You can then focus your time, energy, and attention on the things you can control while letting go of the things you cannot control. A simple way to start is by drawing a circle on a piece of paper. On the outside of the circle, write down some of the things in your life that you cannot control. And in the middle of the circle, write down some of the things in your life that you can control. Some examples of things you cannot control might include how someone treats you, how other people act, whether people like you or not, how other people feel, your past actions, world problems, or the weather. Some examples of things you can control might include how you treat others, how much you take care of yourself, your actions, your attitude, your words, the friends you choose to have, or how hard you work. You can also use the circle of control if you are going through a situation that is causing you stress or worry. Start by writing all the things about the situation you cannot control on the outside of the circle. 
Then list all the things about the situation you can control in the center of the circle. If you can't control the situation, then it is not helpful to dwell or worry, or to try to fix a situation that can't be fixed. Instead, you can free yourself from your worry and stress by doing one of three things. Number one, acceptance. When you practice accepting things you cannot control, then you can focus your energy on things you can control. Number two, letting go. Instead of dwelling on things outside of your control, it can be helpful to set aside or let go of these stressful thoughts. Imagine putting the things you cannot control inside a balloon and letting them float away. Number three, using coping skills. If you find it challenging to accept or let go of things outside of your control, then it can be helpful to use coping skills to manage your thoughts and emotions. Coping skills can help you control how you react or respond to the situation. If there are aspects of the situation that are within your control, then you can use problem-solving skills to come up with action steps to reduce your stress or move you in a positive direction. If you are having trouble with problem-solving, don't be afraid to ask for help. A caring adult such as a parent, teacher, therapist, or school counselor can give you guidance. In conclusion, remember that you cannot control the weather. You do not go out in stormy weather and scold the wind, the rain, and the clouds. Instead, you build a roof and windows on your home. In a similar way, instead of getting upset at the world and other people around you, you can develop your inner strength to defend against difficult situations in life. You do this by focusing your time and energy on the things you can control and learning to accept, let go of, and cope with the things you cannot control. If you found this video helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. For more social, emotional, and mental health resources for kids and teens, please visit www.mentalhealthcenterkids.com. A couple of things. One of the things they talked about, which I like, is the problem-solving aspect of it. And um, I, I find sometimes either we're not equipped or our children's just not, not equipped to solve problems on their own to build resiliency and have some resolve. So, And that's part of the, 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 the journey when it comes to anxiety is how do you go about handling it and what type of... Um, resiliency do you have? And that's the thing that we really need to build up in many of our children. So we're going to talk about this. I saw something amazing not too long ago, and I just thought I, I had to share this. And um, it's something called clay or rock. Now, this would really be appropriate for those of you who scored five to nine, which, which is optimum stress, or 10 to 14. Um, this is just it's simple, but it's brilliant. And it's called clay or rock. And how this works is this, particularly if you have younger children, younger kids in school, and you start there, you can start there because it becomes a life language. But what you wanna do when they're younger, you give them a piece of clay and you just put it in their hands. Just ask them you know, to, to, to form it, reform it, reformat it, you know, whatever they wanna do, you can, redesign it, you know, it's pliable, it's malleable, it's, um, you could do a lot with clay. So you put it in their hand and just have them just, you know, just take it and form it. Then take a, take a rock and give it to them and ask them, you know, what, what can they do with this? You know, can they reform it? Can they redesign it? Can, what can they do? They can't do anything with the rock. And it's a perfect example of the things that one has in control and what you don't have in control. So it really is, again, part of the same theme of what's in control and what's in, not in control. And how this works is this. Why it works so well is that, number one, it places that person, that child, in the present moment. So now we're handling that the mindfulness and we're doing it through tactile um, through something tactile like clay or rock. So it focuses them, focuses them. It, 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 for a moment, it just takes away whatever they're thinking about, whatever they're ruminating about, whatever they're going through to focus on the clay or the rock. That's number one. The clay is what they can control. And this is the language that they have to understand. Is it clay or is it rock? Is it something you can control or is it something that you can? We're going to talk about how to deal with this. It's empowering because it helps develop problem-solving skills, which is the base of being resilient. I mean, in order to be resilient, you got to know how to get out of situations. So this is what happens. If they say that it's a rock issue, and I do this with my son, like I've been doing this, you know, I've been doing this for a little while. Um, 
but I've been doing it lately with him even more so because he'll come to me at, from time to time and he'll mention something that's happening. The first thing I'll ask him, is it a clay issue or is it a rock issue? And he understands what that means because we've been you know, using this language for a while. If it's a clay issue, then it's something I believe he can resolve on his own. And that's what you want to make sure you reinforce with your children or loved ones. If it's a rock issue, that means then we, sh we you should use a scale. And what I mean by a scale, if they say it's a rock issue, mom, it's a rock issue, dad, you know, this is a rock issue because they understand the difference because you've done this with them. Ask them on a scale of one to 10, give me, give me what it is on the scale of one to 10, how much of a rock issue it is, is it? Now, you, hopefully you don't have an alarmist and you don't have one um, who um, catastrophizes everything like Chicken Little with the sky falling down. So if you don't have a child like that or a loved one like that, then listen when they say it because it does a couple of things. It makes them really reflect on the severity of the issue. It makes them really see, is this as bad as, as I'm thinking it is? So now they have to assign a number to it. If they assign a number to it, and that number is a is one through five, again, I would try to help them if it's a rock issue. If it's five through 10, then you definitely need to get in and intercede on their behalf. Okay, so that's 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 the scale. That's the that's how I use this. And it, and it, work, it works brilliantly. It's so simple, but it works really well. And then you identify the specific strategies to manage the issue, the issue if it's not in your control, as I just mentioned. And just remember, your rock and your clay issue, it becomes a life language. You start them when they're young. You can start them when they're young and continue that language when they're in middle school and high school and later in life. I mean, as, as the man had mentioned earlier, that we still worry about our children. They still have issues, even when they're out of the home, they have their own families. So always go back. Is it a rock issue, a clay issue? Right then, they'll know, you'll know, they'll know how to interpret that. You will too. And they will be able to self-reflect and they'll be in that moment of mindfulness. So let me just ask, Jenna is visibly upset that someone posted a negative comment and created a meme about her on social media. Let me ask you, is this a rock issue or is it a clay issue? Also, think about the video. Is this a clay issue or a rock issue? I would love if someone could speak verbally so we can have some discourse. Clay. So Erica says clay. Okay, Erica, can, can you elaborate a little bit more? Uh, why do you say clay? Um, because she can't control what other people decide to post on social media. Correct. But is that clay or is it rock? Clay, you can... You can bend, you can meld, you can, you know, recreate, reformat. Rock, you can't because it's a rock. So which one okay. is it? Is it clay or is it rock? Okay, I see your point. Um, it is rock. It's rock. Okay. Now, it's rock. The issue is rock. Let me look at the chat very quickly before I say something. Rock. Okay. So O said rock. Okay. So it is a rock issue. But what Jenna can do, is it clay or is it rock? I mean, can Jenna do anything about this? It's what can, clay. It's clay. What, it's clay, what Jenna can do. So what can Jenna do? Not think about it. Well, she, she, you know, see, but then if she feels she, she can't do anything about it, then that means she doesn't feel empowered. We have to make her feel empowered. Yes, Jenna, it is a rock issue because someone did that. However, you have the power now to do something about it. So let's turn it into a clay issue. And now you have to give us strategies, whether it's blocking that person, whether it's uh, reporting that person. She has to feel empowered. Otherwise, that stress level and anxiety level is going to continue to build upon each other. Right. Create, well, you could create her own meme. I mean, if that's if that's a solution you, you want to use, you can certainly do that. I, I may not recommend that particular strategy, but um, yeah, but she has power. That's the ultimate thing. We want to make sure that she has problem solving skills and power. Yes, Dr. Jordan. I'm just wondering, because when mm -hmm. I first read it, I was thinking it was both. So mm -hmm. do you have to, per se, select one? No, no, it is both. And that's exactly what I'm saying. It's a rock issue. Initially, she can't do anything about the posting, but she can do something about her reaction to it. That's where the clay comes in. And that's where you sit down and you formulate strategies. 
Yes, Jenna. That's she why did. I thought it was play. Yes. You oh, can I see. do something about your reaction. Right. You so. can do something about the reaction. Right. Exactly. You can do something about the reaction, but she can't do anything about what happened initially. That's out of that's out of her control. It's like the weather. You can't stop the rain, but you can bring an umbrella. So she can do something about this. Okay. So hopefully we're a little we're clear on that. And I'm sorry, I apologize if I wasn't clear. Um, the upcoming state assessments have Sebastian constantly worried about how he'll do. Rock issue or clay? What do you think? I have one in the chat. Clay. Yep, I agree. Clay issue. In the interest of time, I'll just say, yes, it's a clay issue. And what Sebastian can do, he can do a lot of different things to make sure that that anxiety level comes down. He can start studying, he can start preparing, he can start doing exercises, some of the things we're going to talk about today, whether it's positive affirmations, there's a lot that he can do. So this is a clay issue. So if your child comes home and they're worried about it, ask him, what do you think? And have them just think about it. Is this a rock issue or clay issue? Because the more they say clay, the more they'll feel empowered because they could do something about it. And that's what we want them. We want to give them control. He can study hard. Exactly. Exactly. We're going to see how this plays out when we talk about setting goals. Many of you here have heard of SMART goals before. For those of you um, who are in education, different roles, I know SMART goals are used quite consistently and they're wonderful. I use them and uh, there's nothing you can't accomplish if you set a SMART goal. If it is a SMART goal, meaning, um, it, well, I'll show you what SMART means. And for those of you who scored between five and nine, this would be an ideal technique to use, even for your children. If they score between five and nine, let them know this as well. So what are SMART goals? A SMART goal has to have these five specific components. It can't have three, can't have four, it has to have all five. It doesn't have five and it's not considered a SMART goal. It must be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic or relevant, I've seen it both ways, and time-bound or timely, meaning it has to have a, an ending to it. It can't just go on forever. It must have these five components whenever you make a goal. If you make a goal and say, you know something, let's say Johnny is um, five years old, and you say to your spouse, you know, or your partner, you know something, we have to start putting money away for Johnny's education. And another person agrees. Guess what happens when Johnny is 17? Johnny's not going to have any money because that's not a smart goal. It's a lofty goal. It sounds good, but it's not a smart goal by our definition. Again, it must be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. What it does, it gives purpose, accomplishment, and the, and the other thing it gives is control. And this is what we want to do. So let's see how this works. Examples of smart goals. And I want you to ask, there's three of them right here. Which one of these is not a smart goal? I will study 30 minutes each night until the state assessments are complete, completed. I will begin exercising. And the third one, I will practice breathing exercises three times per day for the next five days. Which one of these is not a SMART goal? Because I really want to make sure you get this because this is that's just not just for anxiety. This is a life skill. The second one, exactly. The second one, why? It's not specific. It's not measurable. I don't know if it's achievable because there's nothing there to let me know if this is able, if they're able to do it. Is it realistic? I have no idea. I'll begin exercising. If they say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run 20 miles a day, that's not realistic. Um, is it timely? I don't know. It doesn't have a time stamp. It doesn't have an ending. So that would certainly not qualify as a smart goal. Yes, Sharon, that is, you're right too, number two. All right, so Understand what the SMART goal is, and what I'd like for you to do is let's make a, a SMART goal. In fact, if you go back to Sebastian, the first one would be a perfect SMART goal for him. I will study 30 minutes each night until the state assessments are complete. Perfect. It's specific. It's measurable. We'll know if he did it. If he studied for 30 minutes, we'll know if he did it each night. Is it achievable? I think it's achievable. It's certainly within his purview to do that. Um, is it realistic? Yeah, I think it's realistic. And is it timely? Yes, until the state assessments are completed. So it has a time stamp on it. The third one, I will practice breathing exercises three times per day for the next five days. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely. Has all five components, perfect SMART goal. So would anyone like to take a stab at developing a SMART goal for themselves? And if you don't want to do it now, in the end, if we have time, there's another time to do this where you'll have more of the tools in the toolbox that you can pick from. Okay, so if you don't want to do it now, it's okay. We can try to save it for later on. 
And just to tell you very quickly, I, a couple of years ago, I was um, doing, a, I was presenting a workshop like this and we talked about smart goals and the parents said, wow, I said smart goals. I said, oh, you must use them when you work or in school. Um, and she says, no, no, no. My daughter just came home last weekend and her project was to create a smart goal. Now, I know I was speaking to parents of elementary grade school children. And I said, wait a minute. I said, the teacher's teaching her smart goals. I said, what grade is your daughter in? She said she was in the fourth grade. I said, she's in the fourth grade and the fourth grade teacher's teaching them how to develop smart goals. I wanted to meet her because if every fourth grade teacher taught their children, taught their students how to create smart goals, there would be nothing that they wouldn't be able to accomplish. So this, again, is not just for anxiety. This is for life. And it's a wonderful, wonderful technique to use. Um, consistency. Consistency. Um, yeah, you have to be consistent with it. But guess what? That's what the SMART goal allows you to do. It allows you to be consistent because it's measurable. You'll know whether or not you're consistent. It has everything in it to make sure that you achieve your goals. If it's not realistic, guess what? You're not going to hit it. So it has to be realistic as well. So all these things matter. Any questions, any thoughts regarding SMART goals? Does anyone use SMART goals now? Will they work? I learned to cook three new health recipes. Ah, and then increase to four. I love that. I will learn to cook three new health recipes each week for four weeks, then increase to four. Perfect. It's specific. It certainly is measurable. Is it achievable? It's certainly within your ability. Is it realistic? I mean, only you would know that, but I think that's realistic, Stephanie. And is it timely? Yes, you have some timestamps on there. Perfect, smart goal. Perfect. I had um, an educator say, I use them all the time. But she said, you know something, Mr. Herring? I've never, ever thought about using it with my children. She said, wow, that's such a, such a wonderful idea. I want to start doing it. I said, yeah, they work. She says, I know. I use them at work. So use them. Um, it's a wonderful technique if you, if you haven't. And you want to learn more about it, you could go to go the website and learn more about SMART goals. So let me just shift very quickly. So I see that we're going to be running up against the, the window here. Um, one of the things I want to um, share with you is how to redirect. For those of you who score between 14, um, 10 and 14, many times that's because you're ruminating. There's a lot of worrying. There's a lot of, you know, just can't get out of your way. So what you want to do is redirect those thoughts. But you, if you redirect them, then we have to now replace them. You can't just redirect and say, okay, I redirected them. Now you have to start replacing them. So the first thing to do is redirect. You could do that in a number of ways. You can do it by writing those thoughts, writing um, affirmations, whether it's positive affirmations, write, write positive things. Um, you can either write it or you can say them to yourself over and over and over, like, like uh, I think it was LaVon has showed, shared with us what he does and what he says in the morning. So that's the first thing you do is redirect. The second thing you do is to replace, as I just said. And you can replace it with positive affirmations. You can replace it with gratitude statements. Um, I tend to like both of them. I have my own positive affirmation. I repeat several times a day and gratitude is a major, major part of my existence every single day. When I'm, when I'm walking in the woods, this is what I do. So there's different ones. If you have one for yourself, fantastic. Please don't make one for your children. You could do it collaboratively or better yet, have them develop their own positive affirmation because it has to resonate with them. You know, if it's something you pick for them and it doesn't resonate, they're not going to buy into it. They're not going to repeat it. And these work. They're powerful. Positive affirmations work. It's not some high in the sky stuff. It works if you work it. It's changing the neural pathways, but you have to really do it and do it consistently. As someone just put in the chat, consistency is everything. You have to do it consistently. So let's take a look very quickly at some of the affirmations that have been shared with me. With every breath, and if you can relate to any of these, put it in the chat. And if you could, you could certainly take them if you'd like to, any of them that resonate with you, then let's just put it in the chat. With every breath, I exhale. I Well, with every breath, I exhale fear and inhale strength. Number two, like, we shared, like I shared with you before, very simple one. I got this. Wow, I mean, that's empowering. I got this. Nothing's going to fall. I got this. Number three is my personal one I like. I control stress and anxiety. They don't control me. Number four, I'm a magnet for attracting positive energy at all times. Number five, I know everything will work out. It always does. And that's also a, a, a person one of mine too. And gratitude. I'm grateful for, we're going to go into this very quickly. Let me see what time I have. 52, okay. Um, 
I'm grateful for. So let me do this. What I want you to do is write down three things very quickly that you're grateful for. And for those of you who scored again between five and nine, this is, this is, this is wonderful. This will help you tremendously. What three things are you grateful for? Just write them. Just think about three things you're grateful for. Now, I know you, I, I certainly hope you could come up with three things that you're grateful for, for the air that you breathe, for the food that you ate this morning, for your home, for warmth, for friends, for family, job, job health. I mean, it's just so much to be thankful for. What are you grateful for? Food, health, fresh air, exactly. Family, my health, my health, freedom. Yeah, health is always a big one. Uh, family, opportunity to work, family, yeah. Um, and thank you for sharing. Think about those things, and anytime you're in that space of stress, anxiety, go back and focus on these three things that you are grateful for. Philadelphia, okay, I love it. Healthy kids, love it. Um, think of those things. Always, always have that in your pocket. The three things that you are grateful for anytime you're up against a wall, you're feeling stress, a little anxiety, dwell on those things. And I'm telling you, for those that scored between five and nine, they truly will help and help you maintain that as well. My life, healing from pain and family. Yeah, these are all important. Now look how many people say health. Exactly. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to write down. No, don't, no, don't write it down. Don't write it down. Just, yes, yes, write it down. Write it down. I'm sorry. Write down five things that you have to do when this workshop is over. And I want you to start the sentence off by saying, I have to. I have to um, make several calls. I have to go to the doctor's appointment today. I have to pick up my kids. I have to fix dinner. I, whatever it is, just write down, because I know all of you, this is only what, it's only it's nine, it's almost 11 o'clock, it's 10.55. I know that we all have five, at least five things to do that we have to do today. So write down five things that you have to do. five things that you have to do or when this workshop's over or tomorrow, but it's early enough. So you can say today, the, the workshop this evening, I'm going to do it. It'll be for tomorrow, but for right now, just five things that you have to do. You can put them in the chat if you want to, but you don't have to I have to go pay bills. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Um, so do I have to do the same thing. Okay. But write down five things. I just want to need five things that you have to do. And I want you to say, I have to do so-and-so I have to, do I have to, I have to, I have to. Five things. Now, would someone like to share the transparent, share with me the five things that they wrote? And I need you to say it just like that. I have to. And there's a reason why. I'm going to show you something that's extremely powerful that works immediately. So someone please share their five things that they have to do with me. But I need to hear it, though. I need to hear it. I need, I need someone to tell me. I need to hear it. Because it's important. Because I, I want everyone to hear this. I'll do it. Okay, thank you. I have to answer emails. I have to go to school tonight. I have to go get lunch. I have to open the school store. And I have to be happy for the rest okay. of the day. Okay, good. That's what I want you to do. Take that same list, and I want you to cross out the word have. And I want you to replace it with the word get. G-E-T. And then, or, you, or, or just read them back to me. Instead of saying I have, just say I get. Just read them back in the same order. Okay, just read them back to me. But say I get instead of have. Instead of I have to, I get to. Read them back to me, just same way. I forgot the last one. I was writing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot what the last one was. I apologize. Oh, happy, happy, happy. Happy. Okay, I get to answer emails. I get to go to school tonight. I get to go to, I get to get lunch. I get to open the school store and I get to be happy. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel? Actually, it makes you feel good knowing that this is the things you're allowed to do and will be able to do. 
Yes. What it does, it changes everything. But we're so common, so used to saying, I have to, I have to. We just do it because that's, again, that's, this is what I'm talking about changing the neural pathways. It's hard to do. But if we can start replacing I have to with I get to, what it does is this. It does this. Number one, it makes you feel lighter. Although you still have to do the same things, you don't feel as burdened. You don't feel as task heavy. Um, it also gives you a sense of control. When you start saying, I have to, it's more like you, you don't have control over these things. I have to do this. I have to do that. You don't have control. When you start saying, I get to, first of all, there's a level of gratitude that's implied there. That's implicit. And then it's, a, it's control. I have control over these things. And for those of you that scored, again, 10 to 14 with too much stress, start saying, I get to rather than I have to. You're going to feel a, a total lightness. And you're going to feel so good about it that you're going to look forward to doing those things that you feel that you have to do. Um, turn task into blessings. Yes. I love, love that, Stephanie. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what this is about. But it'll help so much with anxiety. And so if, if I don't know who else practiced this, who, who just did it just now, but if you did and you felt that and feel that, that felt that relief and just felt that lightness, you know, please let me know because it does, does work. Okay. It's, it's wonderful. And very quickly, um, I'm sorry to shift like this, but I'm going to share something with you in the next two minutes and I'm going to let you all get back because I think you have a survey to do. You have a few things to do. There's a, um, a raffle too. Totally missed out. Um, let me see. Let me go to chat before I read this. I feel better mentally. Yeah. And, and it's immediate. It's immediate. It happens. So yes. So please use it and teach your children to use it as well. Not I have to, I get to. All right. This sentence strikes fear in the hearts of teens more than anything else you can say to them. In fact, missing out on something bothers most teens so much. There's even a special word for that sticks for that sick feeling that they get in the pits of their stomach. It's called FOMO. Many of you have heard of FOMO before, fear of missing out. Social media does this to children. And what happens with social media, very quickly, is that social media creates FOMO. FOMO in turn creates anxiety. But what do we do? Instead of, instead of pushing away from social media, we dive deeper into it. So therefore, it just enhances that anxiety. It, it levels it up even more, okay? So this is a vicious cycle. It's like the dog chasing the tail, and he's chasing his tail. He sees his tail. He chases his tail. He sees his tail. He chases his tail. And it goes around and around, and it doesn't stop. So we have to figure out, first of all, how much control does, um, does – social media have on your children if they're old enough if they're engaged i'm not sure so what i've given you i'm, I'm giving you this here is called a social media assessment to give to your children and for you for yourself as well this is the answer key so you'll have the answer key not at all true of me one slightly true of me you, you what you'll do is assign a number uh, moderately true of me three very true of me four and extremely true of me five and these are the questions there's only 10 questions the first five are here i'm not going to read all of these here but you you get to see I, I get worried when i find out my friends are having more fun without me um it's important that i understand my friends in jokes inside jokes okay so you're going to ask these questions and then you'll get to the next set of five and then they're going to add up their scores and their scores are going to tell you whether or not they're not influenced at all, mildly influenced, moderately influenced, strongly influenced, extremely influenced. If they score anywhere between, I'm going to say 33 and 50, please make sure you put some controls on the social media because all it's going to do is drive up their anxiety and they're dealing with it um, so much right now because everything they see and everyone they see looks better than them the, 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 the body shaming, the body sculpturing um, 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 uh, artificial reality augmented reality and they're changing their, the shape of their faces and contours and, and everyone looks like they have a better life I mean, and this is not kids this happens to adults I know someone who's highly um, educated and and it's travel the world and 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 it's asked to speak in different places and every time her cv is like five pages long and every time she goes on linkedin she compares herself to other people she walks away and says wow you know i'm not doing half what these people are doing I said, no, something's wrong with you. You need to, you need to step away from LinkedIn because that's not true. But that's what it'll make you feel. Your self-esteem it takes takes a hit. Yeah, you know, your 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 anxiety just goes up. Is there any solution in social media today? Yeah, there there are there are solutions. You have to, 
you, you have to, just like we replace and redirect our thoughts, you have to replace social media with other things. You have to get them involved in other things. It's not going to go away. It's part of their life. That's how they communicate. It's like taking their breath away. You can't do that, but there's certain things we can do to minimize it and make them feel better about themselves. And I believe that's one of the workshops I'm going to be doing later on in this series as well. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, so you know, so we'll, 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 we'll tackle that when the time comes. Um, I don't know if we have time or not, but this was what I was going to ask you to an example of smart goals, but someone did give me an example of smart goals before. So now that you have more tools in the toolbox, I was going to say, ask you to use one of those tools in the toolbox to create a smart goal, but someone already did that. So I thank you for doing that. So we don't have to do it at this juncture. People have control of what and who they follow. Yeah, exactly. Stephanie, they do. And that's what, that's what we want to do. Make, make them feel like they're in control, like they're empowered. And as long as we can make them feel they're in control, whether it's clay or rock, let them know that. And that's what you that's why those tactile examples are so important and they they work. They're powerful. Powerful, but they work. Okay. So what did we do today as far as review? We started out with an assessment just to see where your levels of stress and anxiety are. Because it's important again. They will, your children will mimic, they will model your anxiety. And unfortunately, children aren't outside as much as they used to. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't stay home at all when I was younger. I mean, we were riding bikes and playing ball. And this, we were never home. We were never playing video games on our devices. We didn't have those things at that time. Children today are in the home more. And guess what? When they're in the home more, they're more privy to adult conversations and adult issues. So your anxiety many times is being modeled and you may not even be aware of it. So that's why it's important to understand what your levels are and what to do to lower it. Regaining and maintaining control, again, was the gist of this entire workshop. And then redirect and replace. I didn't do breathe. I, I covered that in a different workshop, um, the, the different techniques to use. And then just different strategies and techniques that we built around all of this today. So with that being said, um, I just want to thank all of you for the opportunity. Thank you, parents. Thank you, caregivers. Thank you, administrators who are here, friends of Philadelphia Public School System. And um, and thank you again, Sydney, for your help in the background, all the parents who participated. This is my information. You can take a screenshot or a picture of it. Feel free to get in touch with me anytime. This is one of 22 workshops that we offer. Um, they cover SEL, literacy, personal development, as well as personal safety. All right. So thank you. And I'll take any questions, comments, feedback. Um, we always like to improve upon our workshop. So any feedback that you can offer would be tremendous. Hopefully you have some takeaways. Hopefully you learned some things today, some things that you didn't know before. Maybe they were tweaks, maybe they were affirmations, but please let us know. Um, we'd love to get some feedback from you.